Good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, The Beat Goes On, Advanced Diagnostic Cardiac Imaging for CT and MRI. My name is Kelly Baer, and I'm the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the Questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar, as we will be monitoring questions throughout the presentation, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left side of your screen is the Resources tab. Click on this tab for, link, for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during the course of this webinar, you may click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASRT CE credit, you must be registered logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The survey will open automatically at the conclusion of the live session and be available from the IAC Pro Libraries website for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC, the Society of Cardiovascular Computed Tomography, and the Society for Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance. And now I would like to introduce our two guest presenters, Dr. Lawrence Box and Dr. Suba Rahman. Dr. Box is a consultant in the Department of Radiology at Englewood Hospital and Medical Center in Englewood, New Jersey. An educator, he also served as Professor of Clinical Medicine and Radiology at Albert Einstein College of Medicine. And Dr. Box is published extensively in journal articles and currently serves on the editorial board of the International Journal of Cardiac Imaging. He is a member of the IACCT Board of Directors representing SCCT. In addition, he is a founding member of SCMR. Dr. Suba Rahman is the Medical Director for Cardiac MR and CT at The Ohio State University a member of the IAC MRI Board of Directors representing SCMR, Dr. Rahman is a cardiovascular clinician scientist dedicated to improving the lives of patients through patient care, research, and teaching. With that said, I will now turn the webinar over to today's first presenter, Dr. Lawrence Box. Doctor? Thank you. I'd like to thank the uh, IAC for this opportunity to share some of my experience using CT for the evaluation of acquired and congenital heart disease. I will emphasize image reconstruction in standard and arbitrary section in the examination of adult patients. Here's a broad outline of topics I will cover in this presentation. We'll begin with a short discussion of CT scanning of a beating heart and then discuss the predictive value of coronary calcium scoring for cardiac risk assessment. Then I'll talk about the valuable role of CT for coronary stenosis detection and interventional management. I'll demonstrate the utility of CT for working out the nature of these often complex malformations and end with a little peek into the future. Any discussion of CT scanning always starts with a discussion of the interaction of the electromagnetic spectrum with matter. In particular, CT utilizes X radiation with very short wavelength, <clears throat> which interacts with the electrons of the irradiated body part. Based upon characteristic tissue absorption and transmission, a pattern of attenuation is constructed. The electron interaction results in ion formation which mediates radiation-related cellular damage. <clears throat> CT scanners produce series of actually-oriented cross-sectional images using back projection of acquired transmitted X-ray absorption data. Stacks of axial sections are converted to 3D data sets using mathematical reconstruction techniques, providing the basis for image reconstruction in arbitrary sections. 
Here are very early CT images published in 1976, almost 40 years ago, obtained by scanning excised heart specimens. Notice the extreme pixelation and limited detail. Notice the low cavity attenuation against the much higher attenuation of the non-enhanced myocardium. The specimen on our right was filled with contrast material before scanning. Note the high attenuation of the cavity of the left and right ventricular chambers. <clears throat> Third and fourth generation CT scanners are the standard of care for performing cardiac CT. Here, a single X-ray source sends a fan-shaped beam of photons across the patient and the transmitted and scattered photons are detected by multi-slice detectors. X-ray generation is tied to the patient's ECG cycle <clears throat> so that adjacent image slices are obtained within a short interval of the cardiac cycle, producing coherent imagery, reduced enzyme sharpness, and reduced patient radiation exposure. So we use very rapid gantry rotation technology to acquire faster and with greater temporal resolution and use multiple rows of detectors to improve spatial resolution. The intellectual and clinical breakthrough of 64 detector technology is the isotropic voxel, a cubic volume element of very small size. Each gantry rotation produces a set of cardiac image slices the slice thickness of which is equal to the X and Y voxel dimension. As the gantry, rotate, gantry rapidly rotates, the patient is carried through the scanner bore and additional slice images are obtained, which allow accurate and visually pleasing demonstration of cardiac structure. Software packages provided on dedicated workstations provide the interface for application of mathematical tools for producing imagery in standard and arbitrary planes to produce diagnostic tomograms. Here, for example, is a calcified lyomyoma of the left ventricle in a 30-year-old woman viewed in cardiac short axis. Cardiac CT is not an examination for everyone. Certainly, individuals with history of significant contrast reaction, renal insufficiency, or the inability to hold one's breath may not be candidates for examination. In order to approach the use of CT in a rational manner, this group of specialty and subspecialty societies, the ACC, the SCCT, the ACR, AHA, ASC, ASNIC, SCAI, and SCR, evaluated criteria for the appropriate, inappropriate, and uncertain use of CT. These indications may be generalized to include utilization in individuals with low or inter intermediate risk of coronary heart disease and in individuals with structural heart disease where conventional echo and nuclear methods do not resolve the clinical problems. Coronary calcium detection and quantitation is a very helpful means of coronary risk assessment. Coronary calcification detection and quantification was the first use for cardiac CT. Here are images from scans in a man and a woman with family histories of coronary artery disease, but only minimal symptomatology. Coronary calcification is an absolute indicator of coronary atherosclerosis in men and women. However, gender identification is important because women calcify their arteries later than do men so that there is a difference in prevalence of coronary calcification up through the seventh decade, and greater significance of coronary calcification is seen in women at a younger age. The 5 and 10, the five and 12-year all-cause mortality is strongly correlated with coronary calcium score in these patients. Mortality increases with increasing coronary calcium score. Survivorship in very low calcium scores, 0 to 10 Agatston units, is very high, and it decreases with increasing calcium burden. Calcium score greater than 1,000 is associated with significant 5- and 12-year mortality risk. Let's look at the other side of the coin. Just how good is a zero calcium score? Is there a warranty associated with a good result? 
A coronary calcium score of zero predicts lower risk than other risk predictors. The 15-year cumulative mortality rate of all individuals is nearly 10%. It is 6% in individuals with no known risk factors, about the same if Framingham and National Cholesterol Education Program risk analysis perform. But only about 4.5% of coronary calcium score is zero. The value of early detection of atherosclerosis by coronary calcium score and appropriate use of lipid-lowering medication a part of modern management of atherosclerotic coronary heart disease. Now on to coronary stenosis. The detection and characterization of coronary atherosclerosis is the major utility of cardiac CT. CT angiography provides direct visualization of the arterial lumen and wall of the entire epicardial coronary tree. When compared with conventional coronary angiography, the CTA accurately displays the severity and the extent of the disease. Furthermore, the dynamic range of CT image contrast allows visualization and characterization of atherosclerotic plaque. This 56-year-old man was referred for coronary CTA for evaluation of intermittent chest pain. Reformatting image data in planes orthogonal to the arterial axis allows demonstration of arterial luminal area and caliber measurement and evaluation of plaque attenuation, providing insight into the plaque composition and its natural history. Looking at series of patients examined by both CTA and conventional coronary angiography demonstrates high accuracy for CTA diagnosis. When based upon per-segment analysis, the test is accurate and sensitive, with negative predictive value averaging 98%. Utilizing per-patient analysis reveals similarly high, high values. A cardiac CT exam negative for CAD carries significant clinical weight. Comparing the accuracy of CTA with SPECT with a nuclear technology, we calculate the area under the CT receiver operating characteristic curve for all patients and in patients without a history of coronary artery disease, and this shows greater area than that under the curve for the results of the SPECT examinations. Use of CT for post-interventional imaging has received mixed reviews. CT evaluation of intracoronary stent is, an appealing, is appealing, but of limited clinical value. The ability to judge patency is strongly correlated with the luminal caliber of the stent. Notice that the only non-interpretable cases were stents less than 3 millimeters in diameter. Attempting to visualize these stents or to identify abnormalities within this, these stents will not be diagnostic. Here's a reconstructed image through a long 3 millimeter circumflex arterial stent. Contrast is visualized within the entire course of the stent, and intrastent attenuation matches proximal and distal vessel signal. Here is a severely stenosed stent. Notice a severely decreased attenuation in the proximal portion of the stent compared with the distal portion. The stenosis correlates with the selective left coronary arteriogram. Here's a reconstruction from an examination obtained in a 67-year-old man studied for intermittent discomfort months after CABG surgery. There is segmental narrowing of the graft immediately after its aortic origin. Multiplanar images reconstructed in different views confirm the severity of this lesion. <clears throat> Congenital coronary anomalies may present in adult or in children with nonspecific symptoms or occasionally catastrophically with sudden cardiac death. I've always had an interest in the problem of why so few individuals with congenital coronary anomalies present in childhood rather than in adulthood. Demonstration of the presence and characterization of the morphology of these malformations helps guide clinical management. The most common anomaly of the coronary arteries is origin of the circumflex artery from the right aortic sinus. It takes its typical course beneath the aortic sinuses, 
to pass into the lateral epicardium, avoiding any area of mechanical narrowing. When the left coronary artery arises from the right aortic sinus, the LAD may pass safely anterior to the right ventricular outflow, or in a clinically more relevant circumstance, posterior to the right ventricular outflow along the interventricular septum. In this 3D surface-rendered reconstruction, the right ventricular outflow has been removed, revealing the course of the anomalous left coronary artery and the appearance of the LAD in the interventricular groove. Anomalous origin of the right coronary artery from the left aortic sinus has a typical appearance here demonstrated on 4, 16, and 64 detector scans. The artery arises at an acute angle resulting in a slit-like orifice and intramural course through the aortic wall. Coarctation of the aorta is a maldevelopment of the aortic arch, frequently involving, associated with involvement of the aortic valve. This is a scout view from the exam of a 48-year-old man with chest discomfort whose physician had a low index of suspicion for coronary artery disease. These axial acquisition images obtained from this examination, these are axial images obtained from the examination, in the cephalatmos slice, we see a pacified portion of the three great arteries of a left side aortic arch. Just caught add to that, we have pacified the left side aortic arch, but it appears to take a hockey stick acute turn and appears to narrow. Just caught add to this slice, both the ascending and the descending aorta now appear dilated, and just caught add to this section, there appears to be an extension of the proximal descending aorta as well as segments of mediastinal collateral vessels. This is a surface-rendered 3D reconstruction from the exam demonstrating a typical constellation of findings. The hypoplastic left side aortic arch, the unusual origin and course of the left subclavian artery, and the focal coarctation itself. In addition, notice the dilated right and left internal mammary arteries. Here's a 2D image reconstructed in the plane of the most severe aortic narrowing, demonstrating the coarctation itself explicitly. Just a word now about aortic stenosis. Most pathologists feel that all aortic stenosis is probably congenital in origin and clinically manifests itself based on the severity of the malformation and associated malformations present. This image is from the examination of a 95-year-old woman with exercise intolerance. Notice the exquisitely demonstrated distribution of aortic valve calcification, as well as her mild heart failure. CT evaluation of patients who are candidates for percutaneous valve placement has become a valuable means of, pr pr of procedure planning. For example, this reconstruction identifies AB, the plane of the aortic valve, and C, the point on the valve annulus for measuring the clearance of the left coronary osteum, both measurements for proper sizing and placement of a percutaneously inserted aortic valve. Congenital aortic stenosis may present with chest pain and be referred for cardiac CT. Here are short actus reconstructions at end diastole and end systole. At end diastole, the two leaflets are opposed and the valve is closed. And at end systole, the leaflets are severely restricted in their opening, resulting in systolic outflow obstruction. Ventricular septal defects may present at any age and are not infrequently found in middle-aged adults. This is a ventricular septal defect in a 27-year-old woman. CT exquisitely demonstrates the large posterior muscular defect as well as associated right ventricular hypertrophy and biventricular chamber enlargement. Reconstruction in a black sagittal section through the defect also demonstrates the aorta overriding the defect and dilatation of the main pulmonary artery. Corrected transposition of the great arteries is a test of the ability of the imager and the quality of the examination. In this rare malformation with frequent adult survivorship, 
The morphologic left atrium is connected with a trabeculated left-sided morphologic right ventricle, which supports a left-side aorta. We know that the RV supports the aorta because there is a nidus of intermediate attenuation right ventricular infundibular myocardium separating the anterior mitral leaflet from the aortic valve. Thus, we have the left atrium connected to the right ventricle giving atrioventricular discordance. The morphologic right ventricle supports the aorta defining ventricular arterial discordance. Thus, we have the double whammy, atrioventricular discordance plus ventricular arterial discordance defining corrected transposition of the great arteries. This is a 53-year-old man with some history of previous thoracotomy who now presents with intermittent chest pain. The dilated and trabeculated right ventricle forms the right-sided cardiac apex, and that right ventricle supports the pulmonary artery, which in fact demonstrates proximal left pulmonary stenosis and postenotic dilatation. The right pulmonary artery is hypoplastic. Calcification in the interventricular septum tells us that there had been a surgical VSD repair performed. Put all this together, and we have surgically repaired tetrad FLO with isolated dextrocardia. By the way, the coronary arteries were normal. Where's all this going? Let me just allude to a few trends in newly published works. This is a review of very low-dose CT scanning results. I especially draw your attention to these studies. Look at the radiation dose, effectively less than that of a chest film. And finally, this is a figure from Jim Min's group, New York, demonstrating calculation of coronary flow reserve in the red portion of the LAD using intensive computer analysis of image acquisition data, thus providing physiologic correlation with the morphologic detection of luminal narrowing. When I was a young man, blood flow was the holy grail. Looks like we're nearly there now. So to conclude... Let me uh, say that cardiac CT is a fast, safe, and accurate means of investigating acquired and congenital heart disease in adults and children. It produces image data which can be reprocessed to provide visual and quantitative information essential for modern cardiac patient management. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Box. This is uh, Subo Thuram, and I'll be providing some information about magnetic resonance for advanced diagnostic cardiac imaging. If you look at the contemporary cardiac MR service, we address several main categories of cardiovascular disease. Disease, where we're asked to comment on the viability of the heart muscle or myocardium. We are sometimes asked to look at ischemia with stress imaging. And Increasingly, we're looking at what's the term, term non-ischemic heart disease, thanks to the unique capabilities of magnetic resonance in characterizing fibrosis, iron, and other types of tissue characteristics. We're also often asked to look at the pericardium and valvular heart disease, and then CMR has really emerged as the modality of choice to image patients with complex congenital heart disease, and we continue to do uh, other types of exams looking, for instance, at cardiac masses. But what I'd like to focus on with you today are some typical questions that we get in the cardiac MR lab. The most uh, basic question is, what is the heart's function? We answer this through CINE cardiac magnetic resonance imaging, and this gives us information on regional wall motion and overall cardiac function, often reported as the ejection fraction. We have different techniques to do this. The classic standard technique uses short breath holding and is gated with the electrocardiographic signal. Many times, however, our patients with cardiovascular disease are unable to hold their breath or may have an irregular heart rhythm that makes the EKG signal irregular or suboptimal for gating. In those instances, we have good options for real-time CINE imaging that allow acquisition with free breathing and no uh, ECG gating. 
Another appeal of magnetic resonance over other modalities to look at the function of the heart is its ability to precisely measure both the left and right ventricular size and function. This is done without any geometric assumptions about the shape of the heart and can be done with any type of uh, location or situs of the heart in the chest cavity. How do we do it? We start with cine imaging, typically in what's called a long axis plane, and then, as if we were slicing a loaf of bread, take contiguous short axis sections to get images that allow us to trace the inner and outer surfaces of the heart muscle, the endocardial and the epicardial borders, to get very precise measures of ventricular volume, mass, and function. Another common question that leads a referring physician to the magnetic resonance laboratory is how much of the heart muscle is scarred. The workhorse technique for this is called delayed enhancement imaging, also known as late gadolinium enhancement imaging. The fundamental approach is an inversion recovery prepared gradient echo sequence. There are several variations that are now available. But all of these essentially look at the difference in T1 values between normal and scarred or infarcted myocardium. Doing this after the administration of gadolinium-based contrast agent allows us to exploit the T1 shortening effect. And the adage has simply been provided that bright is dead. There are some subtleties to this, but in patients with transmural scar, as you can see in the bottom right figure, this patient's anterior wall and apex are not viable. That transmural extent then dictates the viability of the heart muscle in that region. So the figure shown on the left is an example of a late gadolinium enhancement image from a patient with transmural scar of the lateral wall of the left ventricle. And the middle graph shows data from Ray Kim at colleagues that classically described the inverse relationship between transmural extent of scar and likelihood that that heart muscle could recover function with appropriate treatment, such as bypass surgery or stenting to improve the blood supply. And the graphic on the right shows you what transmurality means. The speckled region is the scar, the white is the viable muscle, and the more extensive that damage is, the less likely that heart will recover function. This technique of late gadolinium enhancement has been used to look not only at infarct scar, but many other types of conditions that affect the heart muscle. And all of these have undergone rigorous validation, as I'll show you in the figures below. So in the case of coronary artery disease-related myocardial infarction, we see damage in the subendocardium. Compare that to the midwall enhancement or midwall fibrosis that typifies non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. The epicardium can appear as enhanced in patients with myocarditis, and there are distinct subendocardial as well as blood pool changes when we use late gadolinium enhancement imaging to image patients with cardiac amyloidosis. The classification of ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy traditionally was done in the cath lab. So if a patient had severe blockages, they were labeled as having ischemic cardiomyopathy. And if the coronary arteries did not have severe blockages, but the patient had reduced heart function that was thought to be non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. The advent of late gadolinium enhancement CMR has changed this paradigm. And this was shown in a paper from the Royal Brompton in 2003, where they started with this traditional angiographic-based classification and found, as expected, those with ischemic cardiomyopathy had infarct scar but those who had been labeled as non-ischemic or dilated cardiomyopathy 
actually could have one of three patterns as shown on the right. Many of them had no evident scar as shown in the top right. Some had mid-wall enhancements, that classic signature of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, but fully 13% actually had infarct scar, even though the angiogram showed non-obstructive disease. How do we explain these potentially discordant findings? The patient could have had a plaque rupture event in the past. The artery opened up on its own but the signature of the myocardial infarction remains by late gadolinium enhancement CMR. This next slide shows mid-wall fibrosis in greater detail, not only from a diagnostic standpoint with validation, as you can see, with histopathology, but also the power of prognostic findings in patients with mid-wall fibrosis. In this study, they showed after adjusting for typical findings that predict worse outcomes in patients with cardiomyopathy, the presence of mid-wall fibrosis corresponded to a much higher hazard of death, heart failure, and ventricular arrhythmias. Another form of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy is called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which can result from various genetic mutations and can present across a spectrum of asymptomatic individuals, those who are mildly symptomatic with arrhythmias or heart failure, but can also present with sudden cardiac death. And the adverse outcomes are thought to arise from disordered heart muscle cells and scar. And this is where CMR becomes very helpful. In this study from Oliver Buter and colleagues, you can see that the presence of late gadolinium enhancement in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was a strong and significant predictor of events in individuals with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This then becomes very useful, especially when looking at family members affected by this genetic disorder and trying to decide on appropriate follow-up and treatment planning. Moving from the somewhat qualitative approach of late gadolinium enhancement imaging to more quantitative techniques, let's talk first about T1 mapping. So with magnetic resonance, we can now get actual T1 values at different locations within the myocardium. From pre- and post-contrast T1 maps, along with estimation of the hematocrit, we can compute something called the myocardial extracellular volume. This correlates very well when compared to the extracellular space computed from directly examining the heart muscle. What can we do with this data? Well, let's start with the non-contrast or native T1 values. In this paper from Dr. Sato and colleagues, you can see that an extremely short native T1 is somewhat diagnostic for anderson fabry disease, a rare but serious genetic condition. And the very highest T1 value can be detected in patients with cardiac amyloidosis. It's important to recognize, though, at this point in the game that native T1 values in the intermediate range may indicate abnormality but are not specific to conditions such as hypertensive heart disease, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, or aortic stenosis. Now that we've looked at some of the common tissue questions, we're often asked, what is the heart's reserve? And this means some type of stress imaging, most commonly performed with a vasodilator drug. Historically, we've used things like dipyridamol, adenosine, and more recently, regadenosine, that allow us to look at the myocardial perfusion reserve. And in a head-to-head -head study of adenosine magnetic resonance versus nuclear or single photon emission computed tomography, you can see from this data that CMR performs quite well, not only in identifying regions of impaired perfusion reserve, but of course, also delineating infarct scar. This is 
useful not only in patients with epicardial coronary stenosis, but also in individuals with coronary microcirculatory dysfunction. This is an example in an adult patient with chest pain and a history of coarctation repair during childhood. The most common complication in adulthood is ischemic heart disease, likely due to impairment of the microcirculation, which can be quantified with magnetic resonance using the ratio of the endocardial to epicardial myocardial perfusion reserve index. In some individuals, we may prefer to use dobutamine as a stress agent. This may arise, for instance, in patients with significant obstructive lung disease where adenosine may be contraindicated, they may have an allergy, or we may specifically want to look at the response to dobutamine to see if there's contractile reserve. Again, in a head-to-head -head comparison of magnetic resonance to another modality that uses dobutamine for stress, such as echocardiography, improved visualization of regional wall motion affords greater accuracy in dobutamine stress testing. What else might be wrong with the muscle? Let's talk a little bit about T2-weighted imaging, which has been a workhorse approach to look at inflammation and edema in heart muscle. In the classic techniques of T2-weighted imaging, myocardial edema was recognized relative to the signal intensity in a reference tissue such as skeletal muscle. And in studies looking at the histopathologic correlates, inflammation was confirmed. We now can use quantitative approaches with techniques such as T2 mapping. With T2 mapping, we take some of the guesswork out of trying to decide if something is bright or not bright, if there's signal dropout on T2-weighted imaging, and we now have a number that, as this study showed, clearly distinguishes inflamed heart muscle from normal tissue. And importantly, the extent of inflammation may be more prominent on T2 imaging even than late gadolinium enhancement. Another disorder where inflammation is prevalent is cardiac sarcoidosis. And here CMR is appealing not only as a diagnostic tool, but potentially as a biomarker of treatment response. So these patients may be treated with more intensive anti-inflammatory regimens to reduce their incidence of arrhythmias and cardiac death. Iron overload has been a very important advance in using cardiac MR to improve patients' outcomes. Here we use a multi-echo gradient echo technique to look at the signal intensity change over time. Images here are shown in a patient with sickle cell disease with severe hepatic iron overload, whereas no signs of cardiac iron overload. This is a young lady who presented with new onset heart failure against a backdrop of myelodysplasia a condition that had required lifelong blood transfusions. You can see that she had difficulty with breath holding, so we employed real-time CINE imaging that showed reduced left ventricular systolic function. And importantly, with tissue characterization, T2 star mapping, we could see that there was significant iron overload in both the heart and the liver. How does this impact patients? Well, this is data from the National Health service in the UK where every patient with thalassemia who's at risk of iron overload related death undergoes a cardiac MRI. And based on the T2 star values, they can adjust their treatment to reduce excess iron. It's incredible to look at the results of this type of approach. In this study, they reported over a 70% decrease in death due to iron overload. So it really highlights the, the right test and the right patient can make a good difference. And finally, what can CMR tell us about flow through the heart? Here we use phase contrast imaging, often in conjunction with CINE imaging. With CINE imaging, we can trace the left ventricular endocardial borders and get the stroke volume, as I showed you earlier. And with phase contrast or flow quantification acquired in a plane perpendicular to the aortic root, 
we can get the forward stroke volume through the aorta. The difference between these two can be taken as the regurgitant volume, how much leakage is there through the mitral valve. And this can be classified as mild, moderate, or severe. In this landmark study by Seth Uresky and colleagues, they looked at patients who were scheduled for mitral valve surgery and they underwent cardiac magnetic resonance to quantify their mitral regurgitation. Interestingly, a good number of these patients actually did not have severe mitral regurgitation. And after surgery, the more precise quantification of their regurgitant fraction with magnetic resonance was shown to be a much better predictor of which patients would benefit in surgery. In this study, benefit defined as improved heart size, i.e. reduction in left ventricular end diastolic volume with mitral valve surgery. Another example of phase contrast imaging to help in the diagnosis of cardiovascular disease is shown here in this young person with shortness of breath, lower extremity edema, and a continuous murmur on physical examination. You can see both anatomic and physiologic information that's provided with magnetic resonance. The MR angiogram on the left shows the anatomic patent ductus arteriosus. And importantly, the phase contrast or flow quantification data on the right shows the flow through this large PDA. We can then measure flow in a through plane manner through the main pulmonary artery and the ascending aorta to get the ratio of pulmonic to systemic blood flow. This QP to QS ratio is an important parameter in treatment planning for patients with congenital heart disease such as this. I've shown you a number of uh, examples, some common questions that we ask in uh, cardiovascular medicine, and I'd like to offer you a few take-home points. One is that magnetic resonance offers a broad range of techniques to answer common questions in the care of the patient with known or suspected cardiovascular disease. MR provides tremendous strength in tissue characterization that can help refine diagnosis and guide treatment. And it's up to the MR lab to really look at all the techniques that we have at our disposal and tailor the exam to answer each patient's specific questions. Okay, thank you, Dr. Raman. At this time, we will begin the Q&A session. And we also ask that all of your questions be relevant to the information in today's webinar. Questions about accreditation should be directed to IAC by phone or email following the webinar. From IAC MRI, I'd like to introduce Corey Mabry, IAC Director of Accreditation, who will assist with the Q&A session today. Corey, would you like to start us off? I would. Thank you so much, Kelly. And for all of you participants out there, I just want to remind you that you can type in questions um, into the panel and should be the top left of your screen if you have any good questions for Dr. Box or Dr. Raman. First question is uh, is for Dr. Box. Dr. Box, um, earlier in your presentation, you were discussing uh, isotropic imaging. What are the advantages of, of acquiring isotropic images? Well, I have to tell you a story. When I, my father, when I was a child, my father was in the linen supply business, so we used to go out to restaurants all the time. And I used to find myself occupying my time building things with sugar cubes. And when the sugar cubes were cubes, my designs looked more like the structure I thought I was building than they were rectangular solids. So you can imagine if you're trying to decompose a three-dimensional body part like the heart into its smallest elements so that you can reconstruct in multiple and, ar and, and arbitrary planes, the smallest volume element that you use will give you the least unsharpness and the least jagginess when the reconstruction is performed mathematically. When scanners were when fast scanners were being developed, the tail end of the two, of 1990 something, beginning of the 2000s, scanners went from one to four to eight to sixteen to sixty four detector rows. When they got to sixty four detector rows, 
the mechanical size of the volume elements became cubes. And at that point, the ability to reconstruct an arbitrary plane became possible and the technology took off. So it's really a function of, of the accuracy of the reconstruction that the small volume element is so dependent. Okay, what a great answer. And I think you may have already given the answer to this next question that I'm getting ready to ask, but I'm going to go ahead and ask it anyways. Um, now, Dr. Box, uh, what, what's the minimum slice capacity uh, for the CT scanner to obtain a good diagnostic coronary uh, CTA images? What's the minimum you'd recommend? Well, I, I think almost by regulation, the uh, insurers, including Medicare, probably won't reimburse if the scan is performed on anything less than a 16 detector scanner, and they may have changed the regulation in the last few years to 64. The advantage of the 64 detector scanner, 64 detectors and up, is that the minimum size of the volume element is obtained. Once the volume element, if, if fewer than 64 detectors are utilized, the volume elements are no longer cubes. They become rectangular solids, and reconstruction becomes less artistic, if you will. You might be, be able to obtain a good result, but your confidence in that result is going to be limited by the potential image artifacts. Great. Good answer, Dr. Box. And in case uh, everyone was wondering, we do require that it's 64 slice minimum for the coronary uh, CTA examinations. This next question is going to be for Dr. Raman. Um, Dr. Raman, during the beginning of your presentation, you were talking about the uh, late gadolinium enhancement images or the delayed myocardial enhancement. There's a couple synonyms for those sequences. What did you say the, the bright signal um, in and around the myocardium uh, represented? So it depends on the pathology. Uh, classically, the late gadolinium enhancement of the myocardium is thought to represent fibrosis or scarring, and this has been validated, for instance, in infarct scar, where we see subendocardial enhancement, as well as in the fibrosis of non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, where we see midwall enhancement. In other conditions, such as myocarditis, where we see epicardial enhancement, it's thought that the signal represents some admixture of inflammatory cells and possibly some degree of fibrosis, whereas in patients with infiltrative disease, such as cardiac amyloidosis, we see enhancement in regions of um, the uh, infl in infiltrative disorder, particularly in, um, uh, in Fabry disease, we also may see a mix of fibrosis and fatty infiltration. Okay, great answer, Dr. Rahman. I'm, I'm glad we, we discussed that. Um, next question is for, for Dr. Box. Now, Dr. Box, is it, is it beneficial to always perform a coronary calcium scoring CT exam prior to every coronary CTA, or what's, what's the thought process there? Well, I, I think if, if your index of suspicion is low enough and you're really looking for, a, for objective evidence for risk assessment, then coronary calcium score is probably your, your, best, your best bang for the buck. It's fast, very low radiation dose, and the value of the, of the result is very high, very high quality. So if, you're, if your index of suspicion is not so low, and if you're examining an individual who has some kind of chest pain syndrome where the risk of significant coronary disease lies, then I think the coronary CTA is the answer, and the coronary calcium score is not going to give you any more information. So I think it's patient selection issue. If, you're, if you have a very low-risk patient and you're looking for risk assessment, calcium score is, is a very good test. If there's a suspicion of coronary artery disease, go for the money, get the coronary angiogram, and establish whether or not there is stenosis. Okay, good, good. Um, the next question is going to be for, for Dr. Rahman. I think you, uh, you, you used the term DOE uh, in your presentation. What exactly does DOE stand for? 
Thank you for that uh, clarification question. DOE is used to stand for dyspnea or shortness of breath on exertion. And it's important to pay attention to this type of symptomatology as it may be the only sign of heart disease, particularly in patients with coronary disease who may not have typical chest pain or angina. Dyspnea on exertion should raise any, a concern for various forms of heart disease. Okay, good, great answer. Um, the next question is going to be for, for Dr. Boxed. Dr. Box, from a radiation dose perspective, what, what test usually has a lower radiation dose, a coronary CTA or a cardiac cath procedure? The, you ask a question with a moving target. Uh, <laughs> coronary, both coronary angiography and CT coronary, conventional coronary angiography and CT coronary angiography have undergone revolutions in the development of the technology. The radiation dose for a coronary arter a conventional coronary arteriogram without an intervention is probably just slightly above what a low dose coronary CTA can come in at. Now the imprimatur here is it's very dependent upon the scanner and the operation of the scanner. The newer scanners have the very low dose, the sub uh, millisievert doses. And those are routinely very low dose and are very safe from a radiation point of view. But those are very new machines. The majority of scanners out there, 64 detector scanners, give you options for lowering the dose, but the dose becomes very dependent on patient size. So generally speaking, the core, a, a modern 21st century coronary arteriogram on a CT scanner can be lower dose than a conventional coronary arteriogram. But that, those numbers are almost becoming meaningless. The difference is almost becoming meaningless. Okay, great, great. Um, I have time for, for just a couple more questions. So to all the participants out there, if you have any other questions you'd like to ask, now is the time to type it in. Um, this next question is for Dr. Raman. Dr. Raman, uh, what is the, the optimal um, inversion time for the, the late gadolinium enhancement series, or is that... Does that, that vary based upon the patient or the time? What are your thoughts on that? Thank you for that critical technique question, Corey. Um, there used to be a somewhat standard approach to pick an inversion time uh, to do LGE imaging in all patients. But as we've matured as a field, it's become apparent that uh, the contrast type volume, time at which the late enhancement images are acquired, all contribute to the optimal inversion time. Some scanner platforms allow you to do what's called an inversion time scout, or you can do this by trying different inversion times. And the goal is really to pick the one that nulls the signal from normal myocardium. So, in other words, do the, the TI scout and then determine the best for that particular patient? Yes, that is the ideal approach. Okay. Um, here, here's the last question that I think we have time for, and for all those of you who have asked questions that we haven't covered, we will follow up with you after the, the presentation is over today. Um, so, Dr. Rahman, one last one for you. Um, what is the future of cardiac MRI and the quantification of absolute myocardial blood flow similar to that obtained by PET and its application to clinical practice in a very busy lab? That's a terrific question, and I think it comes back to what is the clinical question that's answered with this number, absolute myocardial blood flow, that is understandably touted as a unique um, parameter yielded by PET imaging. It's not something we do routinely. On the other hand, in head-to-head -head studies, stress perfusion MR using really robust, high throughput, efficient uh, approaches to visual assessment works extremely well. Okay, good. As it turns out, there's just a couple more questions. I think I may be able to squeeze them in. Um, 
This next one is going to be for Dr. Box. Dr. Box, which scan is better for myocardial stress test, CT or MRI? Well, I, I think MRI has a track record and a good body of literature to support its use. Uh, stress CT, I can imagine at some point down the road where we develop technologies and techniques for its utilization, but if there's a serious question, MR is, is the way to go over CT. Uh, conventional nuclear stress is probably a more reliable test, but I would go for MR over CT. Is late myocardial gadolinium enhancement more effective than echocardiography in measuring the ejection fraction? So late myocardial gadolinium enhancement is really a tissue characterization technique. To measure ejection fraction, we use CINE imaging, and there are considerable data that show that CINE cardiac MR is more accurate than echocardiography to measure ejection fraction. Okay, great. And at this point, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Kelly. Okay, thank you, Corey. And thanks again, everyone. And a special thank you to our guest speakers for today's presentation. Again, we invite you to contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of this live session and also be available from the IAC Pro Libraries website for three business days. In the upper left, you'll click on My Webinars. Look for the title of this session, The Beat Goes On, Advanced Diagnostic Cardiac Imaging for CT and MRI. Beneath this title, you will see the link Take Evaluation. Click this link to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through a new link on the My Webinars page called View Certificate. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you all for joining us today and appreciate your participation.